that I think is a great shot about what politics is really about. It was taken, it's an actual sequence, live and, and, and not live, but, but real sequence. It was election night 1980, which was a very Republican year, it was the first year I ran for Congress. And everybody said, oh, this is a safe Democratic seat. But I knew it was a bad year and people mm -hmm. were sort of attacking my record and I was an unmarried 40 year old and they were beginning to figure some things out. And so that was taken in my sort of inner sanctum as the returns came in. Mm -hmm. And at first we're waiting and then some good returns came in. And so then you see these two, three people choking me, basically saying, oh, you see you were a jerk, you thought you were gonna lose and we knew you were gonna win and you aggravated us for nothing. And then bad news comes in again. By the way, the woman choking me is a good friend who was my press secretary, Thalia Schlesinger, who was Paul Sangas' twin sister. And John Martella, who was my campaign consultant, Jim Siegel, who's a good friend. Uh, uh, but that's the kind of ups and downs of politics. I mean, mm -hmm. first, we're not sure. Then they're giving me a hard time because I was unduly pessimistic. And you're glad. And then we're back to being pessimistic <laughs> because some bad returns came in. I think, actually, that was Framingham. They were, I carried mm -hmm. Framingham. Then I lost Sudbury. That we were, but you won we the night. Nervous. I did win the night, but that's the mm -hmm. kind of remind you this of the like before video. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. We, you have to, <laughs> if you run this really fast, <laughs> you, you, you flip it. And this one here? That one I'm, I'm very proud of, and it's an important story. You know, we talk a lot about coalition building between lesbians and gay men and other groups, and that's an example of how it works. Mm -hmm. In 1943, which some people will remember, the United States did one of the worst things it ever did. It went to, the federal government went to California and rounded up Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans, people who were American, who were either born in Japan or whose, whose parents were born in Japan, and locked them up in concentration camps for no good reason. I mean, it was the worst example of, of abuse. And I remember reading about that in college and saying, mm. gee, what a terrible thing for my country to do. I mean, one of the people who did it was Earl Warren, great supporter of civil liberties, but they panicked and locked people up. And I became chairman of the subcommittee that was in charge of legislation whereby the United States paid claims against it for things that had been done wrong. And I worked with the two Japanese American members of Congress at the time, Norm Mineta and Bob Matsui. And interestingly, they, they, they were both American born members of Congress from California who had themselves been locked up. Hmm. Norm was like 10 years old, Bob Matsui was about one year old. They'd been locked up with their families and I was chairman of the subcommittee and we got the bill through in 1988. We got a bill signed in law, and one of my proudest moments, frankly, mm -hmm. was to stand on the floor of the House of Representatives and read the official words of a piece of legislation on behalf of this nation, Congress apologizes. I think that's a sign of real greatness. And we got the payment, and it was very important to the Japanese Americans. And what's relevant is that a few years later, the Japanese American Civic League, or Citizens League, which was the main active group behind this, had passed a resolution supporting marriage between mm -hmm. gay men and lesbians not between a gay man and a lesbian, oh. but <laughs> between gay men on the one side and lesbians on uh -huh. the other. And um, oh. uh, because as you know, the society has always allowed a gay man to marry a lesbian. Yeah, that's just, right, we've seen the, it the, all the, over. The logical ones they don't allow. But the Civic League had done this, and some of the more conservative Japanese American groups decided this was a terrible thing and they wanted to repeal it. And they had a convention, I think it was in 1993. And Norm Mineta, who was a full committee chairman, he was the the sort of senior Japanese American politician in, in terms of he'd been the mayor of, of San Jose and he was mm -hmm. the chairman of a committee. And you know, politicians don't usually get involved in the affairs of their own local civic groups or their own ethnic group because you make enough enemies here, you don't need to do that there. But in a very hot issue, Norman had to took the floor and I was very touched and people told me about this and he said, you mm -hmm. say what have gay people and lesbians have to do with us? Uh -huh. Well, it was a gay man who was chairman of the subcommittee, Bernie Frank, who helped us get our rights, and how can you now tell us we walk away? And those of us who've been the victims of discrimination and oppression had better stick together. And so that was an mm -hmm. example. I mean, obviously that's not why I did it, but uh, that means a great deal to me. And it, and it was very important because Norman Etta, to his great credit, took the floor and, uh, and, and stood up for us. Yeah, let's move back to the, mm -hmm. the Andre uh, Sakharov was in America and was she was here, mm -hmm. and she wanted, the, the, I think the Russian sent her figuring, well, she'll stay here, and we'll get rid of her. And she said, no, this is my husband. He's back there, and I'm going to go join him. But she did not want to go back to Russia alone. She was afraid they might disappear her somehow. Mm -hmm. So she wanted a congressional escort. So 
We escorted her. Now, you see, that's an Alitalia flight from Milano to Moscow, and nobody was on it. I mean, people figured, hey, you're not, because nobody knew what was going to happen on the plane. So there was like the three of us, mm -hmm. and then a few other guys who were probably American, Russian, and Italian Secret Service people. <laughs> we were very well protected, unless they started to shoot each other. But we sort of <laughs> had the whole plane to ourselves. Uh, great uh, the photo shoot with Brian Cable there? Yes. And over and here? Where you're at now? I was one? looking, oh, here? here. This one? Yeah, what's this? What is, what is this? Well, that is together. Yes, <laughs> entirely too much belly showing, <laughs> but I'm not really, that's, uh, I'm thinner than that. Um, <laughs> that's uh, her, my lover, and I, and the president, who was uh, dressed up as Lamar Alexander. That's as you a can beautiful see. shot. That's my his, Lamar Alexander, <laughs> his Lamar Alexander imitation. Um, he was wearing plaid before Lamar. The, the White House twice a year invites all members of Congress and spouses, and uh, this was once it's inside in a formal event, and once it's outside in a picnic. And uh, this was her and me at the picnic with the uh, Now, when you president. go to these places, do you say this is? My brother. And uh, by now, people know. I mean, mm -hmm. I, Herb's got his official spouse. And we've decided that uh, Herb and I have been together nine years uh, this August. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. And um, we have decided early on that we weren't going to do anything just to make a point, but we were not going to not do something mm -hmm. so somebody else could make a point. So we go wherever else uh, congressional couples go, and I think uh, what we find is if you just do it, people don't make a fuss. I mean, you don't, we don't give them the option right. of saying you can't come here. You, you don't know, encourage here. Right. Yeah. But the, there was one over here that I thought was wonderful. Oh, where was this from? Oh, this was uh, at the uh, Democratic Spouses hair. Luncheon. Oh, Very good hair, okay. yes. Um, at the Democratic Spouses Luncheon uh, with, with Hillary Clinton and all the Democratic Spouses. Uh, and Herb was there, and then he goes to the State of the Union. And again, we have found, I think, uh, you know, it may be the first time people have encountered a half of a gay couple, but it's, it's what happens is they find, gee, nothing bad happened. I mean, I went and I <laughs> talked to this man, and he was very nice, and uh, everything went forward. So I, I, it seems to us that this is one of the best ways we can help combat the prejudice. The group's so fabulous. Well, yes. I'm curious, you can ask Bonnie, is the video at Bonnie Poster, is that a before and after picture, like <laughs> before being out and after? <laughs> is this... Uh, a re-elect Barney, is this a before? Yes, it's considering. <laughs> Actually, that's 20 years old. That's what I, I looked like this. when I was a young, a dashing young man. Um, that's this is when you were my mother's favorite. 19, yes. well, I hope I have yes. it. <laughs> 1976. And I was kind of making a virtue out of necessity with neatnesses and everything. Uh -huh. But it does remind me that, uh, yeah, that's that's what life was like for me uh, mm -hmm. uh, back then. For one thing, I'm, I'm kind of a nervous eater, so when I'm under a lot of stress, when I'm unhappy, I eat a lot. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I eat a lot and gain weight, and I get unhappier. So it's a kind of a vicious cycle. <laughs> so this coming But that out. is uh, a reminder of, of mm -hmm. uh, what things were like in uh, 1976. The fingernail shoe? Actually, that was, yes. Yes. <laughs> that, that I, I, I was thinking of, that was last year's, uh, 20 years ago's poster. Last year, I was thinking of a, of a new poster that was going to be, because the public had a very bad mood about Owen Company, keep the bum in. Oh, I thought I would have I a little like bumper that. sticker like in my that. district. Keep the bum <laughs> in. OK. Um, we met. Do you like the poster? <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> That's the kind of uh, the he's periscope good, shot. He's not that good. <laughs> the periscope shot. Let's see. I'm not comfortable. All right. No, you don't get the shoes, okay? All right. Tell us when you're ready, so that Okay, I am ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Barney, congratulations on being appointed the speaker, of the parliamentary task force, and the point man. Thank you. That was. Uh, Are you having fun? I have been, and uh, well, you know, it's it's at two levels. It's fun on a day-to-day -day basis because when you can really fully throw yourself into it, and you know, the hardest part of my job are the morally ambiguous issues, like have you pushed for enough? Uh, are you making the right trade-off? But opposing Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey, um, there's not a lot of moral ambiguity. They are so wrong on just about everything that you really can kind of just swing for the fences on everyone. On the other hand, while it's fun on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's sort of sad to see things that you care about get eroded and uh, see people lose their low-income he home heating assistance or to mm -hmm. see the Legal Services Corporation further strained or to see environmental things weak. But it, it does make the job easier because you know, look, these, these are the opposition people and they're wrong and you just swing away. Now, do they call you and say, get over there right now? From time to time, yeah. I work particularly with some of the staff people and uh, I will get a call, or usually we know in advance, and they'll say they're planning to do this. Uh, for example, we had a, uh, one of the things the Republicans were getting in trouble over was 
shutting the government down and not <laughs> dealing with the debt limit. And on a couple of occasions, they wanted to sort of adjourn and go away, but they didn't want to get caught doing that. So we would try to make them vote on that. I mean, one of the things you do in a parliamentary body is to insist on roll call votes. And uh, when we were about to leave in early February for most of the month of February, they didn't want to get caught voting on that. So they had the resolution coming forward for the three week break. And they had one of their best parliamentarians in the chair. And, and so the staff mm -hmm. said to me all right now, but it was sort of, we were, we were doing the dance there where uh, I had to yell at just the right moment. And, <laughs> and so yeah, this, the staff will come and say, they're planning this, make sure you get a roll call. Or uh, they're gonna do that, make sure you do that. Were you surprised that they appointed you? Well, I was pleased that they did it. Um, I, I did raise, as I said, the issue, uh, well, are people gonna say, gee, you know, he's gay and, and he screwed up as I did a few years ago. And in fact, uh, one, one uh, reporter tried that, Robert Novak. I mean, Novak, who right. specializes in, in, <laughs> in right-wing hysteria. Um, I think that's what his degree is, in, in right-wing so. hysteria. <laughs> and uh, after the first day, when I was critical of some of what they said, he, I heard him on television say, well, it certainly is surprising uh, that Frank would be doing this. And he basically suggested that I was sort of self-appointed and that everybody else would say, get him back in the closet in effect. And uh, I, I had thought that might be coming. And so I had raised that with the leadership saying, you know, look, I, I want to do this, but I don't want you to tell me. And then you're going to say, well, wait a minute, we can't. And uh, they said, no, we don't care. We don't think it'll make any difference. And I think the answer is that it hasn't made any difference. I look, there, I mean, th there was this effort when Clearly, it was in the back of Dick Armey's mind when he referred to me as Barney Fagg. And, and, uh, and he said that he was trying to say Frank and Harangue. Yes. And now, I've worked on that. Right. It might have been Frank. <laughs> Frank or... or well, I, I thought that the best response to that came, uh, uh, my brother asked my mother, uh, because he said he just mispronounced Frank, and it was an innocent <laughs> mispronunciation of Frank to come out as Fagg. And so my mother uh, acknowledged that, yes, uh, she became Mrs. Frank uh, 59 years before that, and she said in the 59 years, no one had ever introduced her as Elsie Fagg. <laughs> so she was disinclined to believe that that was a simple mispronunciation. But it was clear when, when Army said that. But what? And no one said anything about his name. No, certainly I wouldn't. When, and I thought you were wonderful. I thought uh, and you're, very you're, high I level. I leave that yes. to you <laughs> in your act. But the um, the interesting thing was that when Army said that, uh, the roof fell in on him. Mm. And in fact, he got the greatest proof that he knew it was a mistake. He denied it. I mean. You know, I, I don't think he was being honest when he denied it, um, that, that it was in his mind. And so I think what happened was he did try it, or at least it popped out, and the reaction was so negative that nobody's tried it since. So I think that, you know, that's frankly one more step that we passed, that I was asked to take a kind of prominent controversial position. Some of them thought the fact that I was gay and I'd been indiscreet a few years ago, that that was going to discredit me. And the general public said, please, will you pay attention to the real things, and, you know, th this is not anything that we care about. Do you think that it's harmed you, though? I mean, what things do you think is you've paid a cost for because you're out? Very little. Um, and obviously, I want to say that you know the benefits have been enormous, not just the, mm. the personal benefits, but I wouldn't have met Herb if uh, I'd come out if I had. I think you know Herb has enough sense not to want to live a kind of uh, half-life with someone who was in the closet, so our, our relationship would never have come across. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I think it's even helped politically, because I honestly believe that a lot of people, both in the general electorate and among my colleagues, admire honesty. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's, that's a, a benefit. If I had a chance to be in the congressional leadership, and it's probable that I didn't, you know, there's only a few people up there, uh, that would have meant that I, I hadn't been. I mean, I, when, I, when I first came out to Tip O'Neill, it's kind of an interesting experience to <laughs> sit there. And Tip was a lovely man and, 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 and a very sympathetic guy. And, he, he occasionally, he had a, his own way with words. At one point, when he'd heard the rumor that I was gonna do that, he told some of his staff that he heard that I was about to come out of the room. <laughs> now, I don't know whether, uh, whether he bigger, felt that he would have needed a room as yes. a matter, but um, he indicated to me that, well, he was sorry because he thought I might have been in the leadership. But you know, even if that was the case, and I don't, it, it was a very long shot anyway, um, that's hardly a deprivation. Uh, and in terms of my, my ability to influence public policy or my ability to get reelected in my district, uh, I haven't seen any negative effect. Now the name Barney, is it, is it, it's not the PBS, Purple Barney. No, although there is that, my, my uh, Herb's niece used to ref say to her mother, no, no, I mean the real Barney, not Uncle <laughs> Barney. So she would, she would differentiate that way. And I do have a picture of me with my brother's 
daughter when she was three, of me holding her while she shook hands with, with Bernie. Very confusing. Too. That's, yes. yes. That, uh, <laughs> You know, when, when the network people do this, uh, the big network correspondents rarely bestow themselves unless you're like the president. So very often if they're doing a story and I'm being interviewed, they send a, uh, a pinch hitter. <laughs> it's some, some, some member of the production staff asks you the question and you answer and then they dub the uh, network anchor asking you. And you don't see, you know, it's, you, don't, you don't get a, a two shot. You get me and then the, him or her. I uh, don't trust anything anymore, do you? <laughs> no, but it's funny, the media, they can be the worst. I mean, they talk about honesty, but then sometimes you'll be taping a show on Thursday that's to be shown on Sunday, and they will say, well, no, don't say Thursday. Say, make believe this is Sunday. But yeah, then they, that way you get out of town. Right, yeah. right you're not there. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. So do you think, uh, out of deference to you, perhaps, that they, the PBS named that, that fabulous Barney, I love you, you love me, after you? Well, actually, I... I, I I like to take credit, except Bernie is apparently a sort of a funny name. I mean, Bernie is a name they give sort of characters like uh, Bernie Google, uh, depending on how old mm -hmm. people are. People talk about Bernie Google or uh, Bernie Fife. Mm -hmm. uh, Rubble. Bernie Rubble. Yeah, Bernie, Bernie is kind of a funny name. So um, uh, Bernie the Dinosaur comes out of a long line of <laughs> funny Barneys. Maybe you're more the Barney from the clothes store. Yes. Exactly. Which well, except, you know, when I was growing up, that was a, uh, a kind of a, a, a cheaper place. I mean, Barney's used to be a kind of a, a, a lower rent clothing store. Now, of course, it's become too expensive to look in the window. But, uh, <laughs> but that was named for Barney Pressman, who was the... Oh. Uh, yeah, well, Barney, Barney is, for some reason, uh, there, there was some Russian-Polish name that now must have lent itself to Barney. Is it your full name, Barney? It, actually, my legal name uh, at birth was Barnett, but my, my parents called me Barnett after my grandfather, because among Jews you were named for a, mm -hmm. a deceased relative. And, um, but they immediately be called me Barney, and I had it legally changed because as it is now, I have about a 50-50 chance that people will get it backwards. <laughs> when I show up at the hotel for the reservation <laughs> and it's Frank Barney, or <laughs> and, and Frank Barnett was a much more logical one mm -hmm. than Barnett Frank, so I had it legally changed. I'm in the office where Barney Frank works as representative of the fourth district of my home state, Massachusetts. In 1987, Barney came out as an openly gay man, and I couldn't be any happier. He couldn't be happier either, apparently, because a couple of months later, he met and fell in love with Herb Moses. They now share a townhouse and their lives here in Washington, when Barney's not here at work, that is. So, Herb, what do you do here at Fannie Mae? I am director of housing initiatives. It is my job to create new types of mortgage products for parts of the market that are not ordinarily served by uh, conventional mortgage finance. Oh, and, and here at Fannie Mae, I understand you have a wonderful new domestic partnership. Yes, we, we've had it for about two years. And I think it's the, the best or one of the best in the country. We have um, complete domestic partner benefits. And they just went through and wherever it said spouse, it now says spouse slash domestic partner. And they've really been um, excellent about it. You know, just sort of you know, doing it the way that you want every company to do it. Were you involved in the, the getting it done? Yeah. Oh, okay. Stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl. Daryl. Were you involved in getting it passed? Yeah. Um, actually, there was a group of us who got together. Uh, we have a gay and lesbian employee support group here. And we, we did it in a very nice corporate sort of way. We said, okay. Who do we have to talk to? What do we have to do? We worked very closely with the Human Resources Department. Uh, we checked with people in top positions to, you know, do you have any questions about it? We gave them a chance to, to ask us questions in private. Uh, it was not confrontational at all. And it passed. And they did it because it was the right thing to do. That's yeah. fabulous. Now, I understand that you, you and Barney talk a lot about when you go to events with Barney and how you're going to handle it. Now, do you invite Barney to events at your place? And how does that work out? Well, actually, that's a little trickier because, you know, with him, one, he's powerful and important, so he can kind of do what he wants to do. With me, I am, you know, somewhere in the, in the middle of the corporate ladder, and I have to be a little more careful about how I behave. I've actually found that the biggest issue is not the gay thing. It's the congressman thing. <laughs> like, I mean, he's 
you know, if you have two people standing there, like uh, Barney and me standing together at a, at a conference, you have this problem. Very often the, uh, the situation is we talk about Barney bringing you to events. What's it like to bring Barney to some of your events? Well, it's actually a little trickier for me because Barney is important and powerful and he can do whatever he wants. I, on the other hand, am somewhere in the middle of the corporate ladder and this makes it a little more tricky for me to figure out what I should do. It's actually less difficult from the gay side of things than it is just for the congressman side of things. Uh, for instance, I recently took Barney to a conference of an association that I'm part of and I said, well, I'm going to go to the reception alone. And it wasn't because I was worried about anything gay, it was because like, if you're a lender from some, you know, some small town in Texas and you're there and there's two people to talk mm -hmm. with, who are you going to talk with? The guy from Fannie Mae who wants to talk business or the congressman because you don't really get a chance to talk to <laughs> congressmen too often. So I said, you know, it's, it's kind of a distraction and I, I need to do business and everyone will want to talk politics with him. Do you ever have a little poke that you give him like, shh? <laughs> no, I, I just, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, because people notice when you give people yeah. little pokes. Because <laughs> the other person goes, ow! Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, uh, you know, o occasionally people will want to try and get a piece off of him. Mm -hmm. And that's a little difficult. Uh, he's very good about it. I mean, he's got to be polite because it's my office. Um, I can remember having a, a dinner party at the house a long time ago where I invited a person who used to work here to dinner. And for whatever reason, she decided to go off about congressional perks. And there were two members of Congress at the <laughs> dinner table, and I was thinking, bad move. <laughs> <laughs> and pe both people were arguing with her. Uh, and you know, when she got to the part about, oh, you have the Air Force planes, said, mm -hmm. no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a little delicate to try and tell somebody who was above me in the corporate hierarchy, like, shut up, you're being really stupid. <laughs> I think I'll clear the table now. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking, I'm and I'm, and I'm, and I. This is just incredible stuff. Did you do this? Of course. <laughs> all, the, all the pottery in here is mine. It's all yours. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is like, this this was the prototype for a burial urn. That right. somebody has commissioned a burial urn for themselves, and this was uh, one of the prototypes. And I thought, well, that's kind of a cool jar, so I made a few of them. <laughs> And this? Uh, just a big vase. So. Fabulous, fabulous. Mm -hmm. And where do you do this stuff? In the house. We have, uh, uh, I have a studio in the basement of the house, and there used to be an apartment down there, and I ripped it out and got my pottery studio down there now. What most interested us about Barney and Herb was their life together here on S Street. So who makes the coffee? I usually do, because I usually get up first. I go to sleep a little early. I get up a little early. Our, our days are not about 95% coordinated. Mm -hmm. So I get up, usually I'm up first, and whoever, whoever's up first makes the coffee, but that's usually me. Yeah, who yeah. makes good coffee? Now, is it a cowboy coffee thing? Cowboy coffee? Are you boiling it, or do you have a machine? No, no, we have a, we, no, we, um, we live in a nice, typical sort of urban neighborhood, uh, <laughs> especially for gay men, and there are only three Starbucks within walking distance, oh. so mm -hmm. we get the coffee. We, we, they grind it and, and we make it. Now, do you don't have it on a timer? No, we're, we're not. We try and keep the electronics and technology oh. simple because the more that you have, the more that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you make it, and when you, you have people over for dinner, do you, who does the cooking? Helen. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> we make the coffee at the end of the meal, though. Oh, right? that's nice. Yeah. And who we cleans up? Helen. We do. No, okay. we do. No, 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 we have, no, we have, we, we, it's not a woman who comes in and does it. We, She's a uh, professional a catering. catering service, uh -huh. and we I generally go and pick it up, and we, uh, we serve it. How so often do you entertain? Well, once every couple months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to do dinner parties yeah. for people and get friends together. Yeah. So do you eat out a lot? Well, it depends. I mean, we don't cook a whole lot, but it uh, depends how you define eating out if mm -hmm. going to the uh, Sutton Place down the street and getting a sandwich is eating out, then yeah, I do a lot of it. <laughs> but mostly we, because maybe once every two weeks there's some kind of an event we go to, but uh, most of the time we we eat here, but it's rarely cooking from scratch. I mean, we're both working, we generally don't get home. In fact, you know, we're usually sometimes one's home by seven, the other at nine, or vice mm -hmm. versa. I've got the legislative schedule, although I have 
one sort of advantage, disadvantage, it's hard to notice. If I say I'm working late and that's why I won't be home, she can turn on C-SPAN and check up on me. So <laughs> if I say I'm working late and uh, I have to be working late because his television is on. <laughs> really helpful. I do, one of them was how to throw large and it showed how to, because that's about 25 pounds of clay. Wow. And like this one is about 15 pounds. The one behind you is about 20 pounds of clay. And it's very difficult to center that much. It just takes a lot of strength. And there's also a couple tricks that you learn of how to manage that much. That are actually still pretty good. So, so basically if the Fannie Mae thing, if the representative thing doesn't go, you have to sell I, I can always support us okay. uh, as right. a potter. That's right. okay. Yeah. Goodbye. A lot of people have successfully done that. Uh, uh, I'm, I think... Uh, <laughs> That and uh, food stamps would probably get us through. Yeah, I think so. And certainly Barney has worked with a number of, well, psychoceramics, crackpots. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I think you're comfortable. What does that mean? <laughs> I've always loved that. Um, when I was in high school, I, I think my ceramics teacher was gay, and I had ceramics alternating with Jim, and he used to <laughs> sort of let me hang out in the ceramics room and cut Jim, and, and so, and I, he, he was just real nice about it. I'm sure he, he like, knew, but uh, no idea what happened to him. But, mm. uh, I just kind of stuck with it and got to be good. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I did. I, I, I decided like at some point in my life, I was like, should I become a potter or should I do something else? And I got an MBA, but um, if I hadn't have done that, I never would have been able to afford to have my own studio. Mm -hmm. Do a ghost thing? No, it's uh, giggle messy. Oh, okay. <laughs>